Happy New Year, everybody. This is our first presentation for the year 2021 with the Natural History Society of Maryland. I am Bronwyn Strong, the program coordinator for the society. And I'm so happy that you're able to join us for this official meeting of the Fossil Club, which due to the pandemic is open to everyone, whether you're a member or not. But we do hope that if you enjoy fossils as much as we do, that you would consider uh, joining uh, the Fossil Club where you can take a deeper dive into that subject matter. We are so excited to have JP Hodnett here with us to share his knowledge and expertise with us on the subject of Paleozoic sharks that are swimming or swam in what we now know as the Grand Canyon and Mammoth Cave. Um, you wouldn't think about going to look for them there, but there they are. He is the head paleontologist for the Maryland Dinosaur Park. Um, and if you haven't known that we have a dinosaur park, we do. Dinosaurs roamed Maryland. We actually have a state dinosaur that I believe was discovered in what is now uh, the park, but please correct me on that if I am wrong. Um, JP also worked for the National Park Service in the paleontology um, program and has been traveling all over the world looking for our friends from the past. And I don't know a better night to take a um, trip in a time machine and get away from today and go back in time, far, far, far away. Um, and, and, and to another time, another place um, where we can, can see and, and learn about that. So I'm gonna stop talking now, but you please, if you have a question, anything, put it in the chat box. We'll make sure that we, we cover that. And JP, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much for coming um, and, and sharing with us. We can't wait to learn from you. Thank you for that introduction, Bronwyn. Thank you. And thank you everyone for having me tonight. Um, yeah, uh, I am the paleontologist for Dinosaur Park. Um, my day job is typically dealing with uh, Cretaceous fossils from the uh, Laurel area. Um, but my side passion is the evolution and ecology of essentially Paleozoic and Mesozoic uh, chondrichthyans or simply sharks. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you all get the presentation going. I'm going to go off the camera, but you can hear me all. Get a thumbs up if you can hear me. All right, got nods, excellent. Um, so I'm gonna be basically sharing you what I kind of do as my side job or what, what I moonlight uh, on the weekends when I'm not dealing with uh, dinosaurs and crocodilians and things like that. Um, it's my uh, work I do with the National Park Service. Um, I've kind of worked as a contract paleontologist, and um, I'm involved with two major projects uh, with the National per, uh, Park Service um, and their paleontology program, which is actually based right here in Washington, D.C. Um, so the, the topic of today is uh, from caves to canyons, searching for ancient sharks in our national parks by me. Um, but to get going, I kind of want to actually uh, thank a couple people who are kind of like major components to these projects. Um, so this little collage right here is actually some of the major people, players uh, in the projects that I'm working on right now. The uh, patriotic gentleman on the left is actually my, my other boss. Um, his name is uh, Vince Santusi. Uh, Vincent is the uh, essentially the senior paleontologist and program coordinator for the paleontology program for the National Park Service. Um, in the middle uh, sec uh, section there um, is my crew from my work I did in the Grand Canyon in 2019. Um, the top photo is Tom Olson, who actually did a lot of work with me when I was an undergrad uh, in the Flagstaff area. And he's one of these, these prolific fossil finders uh, for the state of Arizona. Um, the woman next to him is uh, Dana Boudreau, who now works at the Petrified Forest uh, National Park. And she was also a, a major help when we were working in the south rim of the Grand Canyon. And the gentleman on the right, uh, some of you may know, that is Max Bovis. Uh, Max is a 
a local fossil collector. He's also one of my staff members at Dinosaur Park, and he joined me in 2019 to help me look for sharks in the Grand Canyon. And then below, again, is me and Max, but it's um, Ann Miller. Ann Miller helped us on the North Rim, and we made some major discoveries on that side of the Grand Canyon. And then on the right-hand side are the Ricks. Um, it's Rick Toomey and Rick Olson. Rick Toomey is the gentleman staring into the light uh, at Mammoth Cave. Um, he's one of the scientists uh, for the uh, Mammoth Cave Park System. And uh, Rick Olson is a gentleman showing his knife, not in a threatening manner, but making sure he, you see what tool he's using. Um, he's actually about to extract a shark tooth from the cave ceiling. And both gentlemen have been a huge help for the project I've been working on at Mammoth Cave looking for prehistoric sharks. And they actually helped uh, gather a bunch of team members that I imagine would be another uh, several slides of the, the volunteers we had uh, from their team. Um, and then lastly, I do need to thank my uh, former advising professor and current writing partner um, at Northern Arizona University, uh, Professor Emeritus uh, David Elliott. Um, he is actually the guy uh, who got me into fossil fish. It is all his fault. I will blame him profusely for that. And what wound up happening, taking a step back, in my early years as an undergrad at uh, Northern Arizona University, um, I did not have really that much of interest in studying fish. What it wound up happening, however, I was taking a class with Dave Elliott, and uh, it was a paleontology class on invertebrates. And he said, oh yeah, by the way, um, the bedrock of Northern Arizona, Arizona University campus is made up of a Permian limestone called the Kaibab Formation. And there are fossils there. So like, oh, that's kind of cool. Well, on my way to, to one part of the campus to another, uh, I did stumble across some of that bedrock and in one section of rock right next to the sidewalk was a shark tooth gleaming up at me. And it kind of literally snowballed after that um, into what is now kind of my, my uh, passion career here. Um, the photos I'm showing here are actually back from, from 2009 when I was a senior uh, at NAU. And the fossils to, uh, sorry, the pictures to the left are some of the fieldwork I did on site on campus. What is interesting about the Kaibab in Flagstaff, Arizona, it's kind of a trash rock. A lot of people will dig it up. They will either uh, decorate their yards with it. Um, they throw it in the, into landfills and um, they don't really think about too much about it. However, these rocks are loaded not only with invertebrate fossils, but vertebrate fossils, particularly fossil fish. And the images on the right are actually some examples. The top image on the right is a partial tooth, uh, a tooth plate for my bony fish. And then the other fossil on the bottom there is a shark tooth embedded in essentially a matrix. And then the center photograph is actually an important site. This is the type locality to several sharks that I've described um, back uh, right after 2009. Uh, there were a dozens of new species. And what it is, it is a ledge that is just a slight road cut in a neighborhood just right outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. And there's actually a very sandy lens right underneath it. And all we had to do for this project was to go in there with a five gallon bucket and just fill it up with these loose sands. And then we screen wash them. And then we get, you know, hundreds and hundreds of fish fossils. So that kind of started my career. Um, however, I took a turn from just looking at fish bits and isolated teeth to I actually found a complete shark. So this is what's nicknamed uh, in New Mexico, the Godzilla shark. This comes from a, a late Pennsylvanian site, which is approximately 300 million years. It represents an old lagoon um, when the parts of New Mexico actually were hot and tropic. And uh, this is actually is a new species of what's called a tinacanth shark, which I'll go into a little bit more detail. And it will be out later this year. So I'm super excited about it, but it's from finds like this that actually helps kind of advance my knowledge on prehistoric uh, Paleozoic sharks. Um, so I was thrilled when I found this in 2013. I literally found the tip of the nose and it's about, it's a shark of approximately seven feet long uh, with huge dorsal spin spines on its back. Um, so I, I will be happy to share the publication once it's, uh, it's out to every one of uh, the people here. Um, but for those who do not know, I mean, what are sharks? Um, they are fish. So these are organisms, vertebrate organisms that breathe with gills. They live in the water. They need water to basically uh, exchange gases to live. Um, but they are known as, uh, as the cartilaginous fish. And they essentially is that the, the skeleton of their bodies is 
primarily composed of cartilage. Now, this is not the same cartilage as your nose or your ear. There's actually a higher calcium content to their, their cartilage uh, for their skeletons. And uh, it's actually, it actually strengthens that cartilage. And it actually gives it a slightly more uh, better rate to preserve in the fossil record. But overall, cartilage is something that's extremely rare uh, to find in, in basically any given locality where you find uh, shark fossils. Um, there are some exceptions, and we will see some interesting exceptions uh, shortly. Um, but I'm going to use sharks as kind of like as a catch-all term because uh, shark biologists, uh, who you know, who people who dedicate their lives to studying these organisms, um, they actually define sharks slightly different than the way we would usually typically think about sharks. Um, there are a group of animals called the true sharks, and there's another group of animals called uh, the ratfish. Um, and that's the, the, essentially the major division of what we know as chondrichthians. There's two major groups. There's one called the Uchondrocephali, which are the ratfish lineage, and then the elasmobranchs, um, which are what we call the true sharks. So I'm kind of having a little bit of a primer here because I'm going to be talking a lot about a lot of different groups uh, as part of the kind of the discoveries we made. So we're going to start with the elasmobranchs. So again, these are the modern sharks in Ray lineage. Um, Essentially, how this uh, works anatomically is that their jaws are not exactly fused to their, their cranium where they keep their brain case. Um, the upper jaws are loosely attached by ligaments, and they tend to have uh, true teeth rather than having dental plates. Um, but some of them will form like continuous uh, uh, dental batteries, and eventually they just kind of slough off. So that's why shark teeth are actually one of the most common fossils you can find. In any given location around the world, is because they continually uh, lose and replace their teeth throughout their lives. So that's why places like Calvert Cliffs is so awesome to find sharks, because you know there was lots of sharks there. They're losing their teeth and they're getting preserved as fossils. Um, but the other distinguishing trait about elasmobranchs is that they have their gills directly behind their cranium, um, and that's a big distinction between one group and to another is how your gills are placed uh, on your body. Um, there's a lot of major groups that uh, I will show you guys about elasmobranchs. Um, this is kind of an anatomical primer. So these photographs on the on the left kind of shows how those jaws are loosely attached to the cranium, and then again showing where the gills are placed in elasmobranch sharks. Hey, JP, um, in terms I, of ancient sharks. JP, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Can I stop you for just a quick second? On your screen. Part of the presentation is being obscured by that gray box on the right, and it could be your um, a list of the participants or your chat. How's that? Box. I think that that's perfect. Better. Okay, good. Thank you, guys. Okay. I was worried about that. <laughs> All right. So anyway, um, getting back to Paleozoic sharks. So the earliest sharks, sometimes we just loosely call the basal sharks. Two major groups. There's one group called the phobodonts, and these are eel-like sharks, uh, especially with one called Thranacodus, which is found from the late Mississippian rocks of Montana. And we find loose Thranacodus teeth elsewhere in the world. Um, like I said, this is an eel-like shark, very specialized bodies. Um, even some of the older ones we find in the Devonian are kind of on the long eel-like uh, uh, bodies. And they have grapple hook shaped teeth. Uh, there's another one that's kind of a bit of a controversy right now in terms of uh, ancient shark researchers. Um, these are the Samorids. The Samorids are a group of sharks that um, are typical, uh, are modeled uh, with uh, the animal called Stethicanthus. These are also known as the brush spine sharks. This is a, a very specialized uh, first dorsal fin uh, that only the males have. Um, and it's kind of a, a, a sexual organ in terms of that it kind of differentiates it between male and female uh, of this group. Um, not all of them have it, though. There are males and females that are totally lacking this uh, brush spine complex in some, some uh, parts of the family tree there. Uh, but they tend to kind of have what we have we consider the typical Paleozoic shark tooth, where you have a, a large central crown and there are some lateral cuspids on the side, um, but they're, they're tooth base, or sometimes we like to think of it as a tooth root. Um, it actually sticks out at a, a right angle, kind of like an L, um, compared to some of the sharks we may be more familiar with in places like uh, Calvert Cliffs, where it's more downward angled. Uh, but then we have things that are more closely related to uh, modern sharks, the xenocants and tenocants. Uh, xenocants are kind of neat in that one, they only have one uh, dorsal spine. Um, and the more uh, 
I guess we call basal uh, forms. Uh, or, or it's hard to say to use the word primitive, but uh, we like to use the word basal that they're they're more lower down on the on the branch of the family tree. They the that dorsal spine is loosely inserted into their bodies, um, and it's usually around the beginning of their uh, dorsal fin, which is they have one essentially large uh, uh, dorsal fin. But in more advanced forms, that uh, spine actually has moved forward. And um, it actually attaches itself to the cranium. So it actually comes kind of like a weird backwards facing unicorn horn um, that actually originally was a dorsal spine. Uh, in terms of tenacants, however, uh, they are actually deeply inserted. They have a very elongated uh, spine root that's attached to the basal cartilage that supports the dorsal fin. And um, these sharks tend to have what we can uh, again have the more like tall median cusps and the more uh, uh, pronounced lateral uh, cuspids. And in xenocans, are actually their cusps are V-shaped. They actually the this middle cusp has reduced in size, and they actually evolved to have the lateral cusp being enlarged and very blade-like. Uh, most of the xenocans we know of uh, are freshwater, though there is one species that I deal with a lot that actually is marine, which I will show you some pictures of in a moment. And then we have essentially the modern shark uh, branch of the of the uh, shark family. Um, these will be th well, the types of sharks that people will consider are true sharks. Um, but there's kind of three major groups within that branch. So you have the protoacrodonts, where are very primitive. They evolved uh, during the Devonian about uh, 350 million years or so. Um, they have essentially more like crushing than, than slicing teeth, though we do have a form from the Grand Canyon from the late Mississippian that actually evolved uh, blade-like uh, slicing teeth. Uh, you have hybridons, which actually is a shark you find here in Maryland. Um, the, the picture I have in the middle, those are all fossils from Dinosaur Park. A um, few of those are actually in the Smithsonian collection, and then others are actually uh, now in our museum collection for the park. Uh, and then, on, of course, on the right-hand side, we have modern sharks and modern uh, rays. And that's what we call the Neosalation group. And they evolved actually fairly early uh, during the Paleozoic uh, by the, at least the late Mississippian period, um, roughly 340 million years ago. So then we get into ratfish and kin, uh, formerly called the Uconchocephali. And this is a massive group. Uh, if you don't know, ratfish are actually a group of fish, uh, cryolagenous fish that are still alive today, and they're essentially uh, modern shark cousins. Um, but they'll, these guys actually have the jaws firmly attached to the narrow cranium, and in some cases, like the true ratfish, they're completely fused with the narrow cranium. And their teeth can either be true teeth, there is actually a tooth and then a vascular uh, root essentially to it. Um, they can also have fused whorls, where they're actually all the, the roots and cells are actually attached to one another. They still get the vascular uh, uh, blood flow through them, um, and they almost look like a tooth battery that will fossilize. And then there's also continuously growing tooth plates. Um, and the other major anatomical feature of the uconchocephali is that their gills are not positioned behind the cranium, but actually underneath it, or just, just behind where the ears would be located. And quick uh, shots at that. Um, for those of you who've ever heard of Helicoprion, Helicoprion is part of this ratfish group. Um, one of the things that's been uh, studied is how this world grows. And it is actually a single tooth that has a continuous root, but it grows the crown individually over throughout its life. And it basically continuously grows inside that uh, lower jaw. Uh, so people always think, well, don't they just fall out? Well, some do, but in Helicoprion's case, it's a single root and it forms a crown as it gets older uh, over time. And then uh, the top image here is a rhino chimera and just showing where the, uh, the position of those gills are, which is like tucked right underneath the, the brain case and uh, between the shoulder girdle. But in deep time, these are actually pretty diverse. Uh, we have the Parasalachians. Uh, which are kind of these cute little uh, ratfish uh, relatives, but they, instead of having tooth plates, um, they actually have individual teeth. Um, they also have, can have prominent dorsal fin spines, uh, and they tend to have kind of elongated tails. Uh, you have the aurora dontids. Um, these can be very massive fish. Um, 
there is actually a half a specimen on on display at the Field Museum in Chicago that was found in uh, Illinois, if I remember correctly. And it's only half a body and it's 12 feet long, but they have tiny minute teeth. Um, we find teeth of, of this kind of shark both at the Grand Canyon uh, and at uh, Mammoth Cave. Um, and judging from basically extrapolating from the size of the teeth, uh, a tooth about the size of, of an adult human thumbnail will belong to a shark that's roughly 12 or greater in length. Um, but I have seen teeth that are on the verge of 10 centimeters. Uh, so that's a very <laughs> large tooth. And uh, kind of on a, on a hy hypothetical speculation that uh, these may represent uh, sharks that can reach up to whale shark size going back to the Paleozoic. So at least the, the Pennsylvania about 300 million years ago to even up into the Permian. And then of course you have the world tooth sharks which are famous with Helicoprion, um, but there's all other different kinds of forms and they have very kind of elongated almost dolphin-like bodies. And these may have been specialists in feeding on small fish and on, on cephalopods, uh, things like squids and, and um, ammonites. Uh, we have the petalodonts, which are a close group uh, related to the true ratfish, except by having tooth plates, they actually have individual teeth that are petal-like, hence the name petalodonts or petal tooths. And they can be highly variable, and uh, we find them throughout much of the Upper Paleozoic. Uh, they first appeared in the fossil record uh, roughly, I want to say about 350 million years or so. Um, and they tend to start off as small little uh, animals, um, and they, some of them can actually uh, reach large sizes, uh, which we will see from the Grand Canyon. Um, but they tend to have some trends with their bodies. They have uh, enlarged pectoral fins and low dorsal fins, and some of these even formed uh, almost skate-like uh, uh, ecologies uh, going back uh, to the late Mississippian. And then, of course, we have the true ratfish. Uh, Paleozoic ratfish can look really ugly. Um, the two pictures on the right were done by uh, paleo artist Ray Troll. Uh, the species on top is actually a new species I'm working on from New Mexico, from the same site as Godzilla shark. Uh, this is a brand new animal, and it actually has really uh, uh, exaggerated features on the on the skull. Um, it has this kind of this weird uh, unicorn process above the eye, and then right in front of that. Oops, I think I stopped and came back out. You did. All right, I'm back. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let me try this. Okay, see if I can keep going. Whoop, back here. There we go. All right. Where was I? Oh yeah, so ugly ratfish in the Paleozoic. Um, yeah, so there's the top one is is a new species I'm working from New Mexico, and then right in front of the eye is this weird little finger-like projection called a cephalic tenaculum. Only males uh, in ratfish uh, in the past and alive today have this feature, and what it is, it's this little finger-like projection that actually is used in help with mating. The male will actually use that to flex and grab the uh, fin of the female and then use it to help the guide the girl where they need, he needs to be uh, to continue mating. Um, the lower one on the bottom there is a, an animal called Helotus. We've known about Helotus for over hundred years, but this is the first time we're actually starting to understand what it actually looked like. We have teeth going back, uh, described back in the 1800s, uh, but a colleague of mine from the University of Chicago is actually been scaring nodules with preserved shark heads in it. And this is what he's getting is what these things actually look like. Um, and having these almost weird, ugly, uh, kind of goblin-like faces. Uh, living ratfish, on the other hand, they're actually really adorable. They're, they're very cute. And um, like the hydrolag or spotted uh, ratfish, which is the uh, picture of the ratfish in the middle, uh, upper middle. Um, they have faces almost like uh, guinea pigs, in my opinion. Now, what makes a ratfish a ratfish is that they tend to have uh, their primary dentition is made of tooth plates. So these are continuously growing dentitions. Um, and depending on who you are in terms of your ratfish family is like how many you have, uh, which is uh, what you really define uh, each group as. Uh, so 
this is a little background of uh, what I'm going to be discussing next. Um, so I'm involved with a project called the National Park Service Paleontological Resource Inventory. And what these, uh, or just simply PRIs, and, and what these pro uh, projects and programs are is for uh, gathering resource information about the fossil resources within a given national park or monument. Um, and some of these can be quite extensive, uh, but what they usually include um, are information like literature reviews, like you know, if fossils were collected from a, a National Park uh, Service site. Um, one of the best examples I can give you is like Dinosaur National Monument. There's a lot of literature that uh, refers to or describes fossils from Dinosaur National Monument. So uh, there's a literature review, which is gathered up and, and formed into uh, kind of like a catalog system. Well, we'll check museum collections, uh, like physically go into the museum collection, and look for uh, material that was collected from national parks and monuments, or database mining. If there's an actually a, uh, the museum actually has their database online, we'll start there and then see about going taking pictures of stuff we want to uh, have more information on. Um, there's a field work component as well. Um, this is where we can try to find uh, localities that have been mentioned in the literature. Uh, and see where we can relocate those. Um, Petrified National Park or Petrified Forest National Park does that quite a bit. Um, and then kind of like what I've been involved with is actually looking for new fossil resources. So new localities within a park. And then as part of the report, we'll actually form suggestions for management and further work. Like if these sites are um, accessible for more research, for more data, or um, this is the fossil resource that needs to be protected, uh, things like that. Um, and from this is we actually gathered data saying, uh, yeah, 280 of the, a lot of our national parks uh, out of 423 actually have fossils within their properties of some form or another. And my part is actually dealing with the Grand Canyon and Mammoth Cave. So let's talk about sharks from the national parks. So we're gonna start with the Grand Canyon. And in terms of time, we are going to kind of work backwards. We're gonna start with the Permian um, quick background on the Grand Canyon, if you have not been there, it is the largest canyon system uh, on the con uh, in the world, essentially. Um, it's about 1,000, uh, 1,900 square miles. Um, you find it in northwestern uh, Arizona, my home state. Um, and it began to start to form uh, back in the late Cretaceous about 70 million years ago. But the way that we see the Grand Canyon now really didn't start happening uh, about the, the Miocene, so roughly 20 million years. And as part of the, this project that I was involved with the Grand Canyon, um, since I had a lot of experience working in uh, the Flagstaff area, especially with Northern Arizona University, um, I really wanted to hit hard the Kaibab Formation. So if you have been to the Grand Canyon and you're standing out, looking out over the, the uh, canyon um, at the visitor centers, um, you are standing on the Kaibab. It is the capping, uh, rim cliff uh, at the park. And uh, it used to be a shallow seed approximately 260 million years ago. Um, and one of the things that uh, you see quite a bit throughout the Grand Canyon is what we call bioherms. These are not exactly uh, what we would call like a coral reef or something like that, but it's like a buildup of life that form reef-like systems uh, within a shallow sea. And these reef-like systems, again, support other organisms, things like fish, um, and this is the reason why we get such a rich uh, fossil record of, of fish uh, from these sites. And here's some examples uh, of stuff that comes from the Kaibab Formation. From the Grand Canyon region, historically, there has been a number of different kinds of large uh, fish. And that's actually something that's really cool about the Kaibab is that there are a lot of large sharks that actually come from these early Permian rocks. Um, but then there's also the Flagstaff region, which we kind of get a slightly different fauna. Um, we do get giant tina cans, so like that uh, Godzilla shark, but on the larger scale. These are things that are great white size or larger. Um, but then we also get smaller sharks, like we get small early uh, hybodonts, both with crushing dentitions and piercing dentitions. We get really weird pelodonts with uh, tricuspid teeth that almost look like a spork. Um, I do also have to point out that spork tooth peladon, my wife found that um, when we were dating, and it was half the reason why I married her, because she's really good at finding fossils. 
Um, and a little bit of history. Uh, so one of the earliest fossils actually uh, to be described from the Kaibab happened in 1938 by the gentleman on the left there. Uh, Edwin McKee was one of the first naturalists and geologists to actually work for the park system at the Grand Canyon. And much of the geology and the paleontology, especially the Paleozoic ge uh, geology, um, was based on his work. So he basically worked from the 1920s to the 1980s uh, trying to understand the geology and the, the fossils that they, they contain and wrote up basically what, what we know still used today as the geology of uh, the Grand Canyon. And it's a ratfish tooth plate. It's from the lower jaw. Um, and it's from a shark called uh, Deltotus mercuri, which is actually something that's kind of common elsewhere throughout the American Southwest. Um, where I'm from. Um, but then there's this thing. And this is actually one of our target specimens uh, or target species we, we were looking for at the Grand Canyon. It's called Megatina pedalis kybanus. Um, we being from Maryland, we are well familiar with uh, megalodon. And when we picture megalodon teeth, you know, these are hand-sized shark teeth. They're the prize of any kind of collector if you're going out looking for these things. Um, this animal actually has teeth that can rival or be greater than in size of me uh, megalodon. The thing is though, uh, instead of having these huge batteries of teeth that you, you think of a modern shark, um, it actually only had two primary teeth, one on top and one on bottom. Uh, the tooth on the left is the specimen that was found on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And we tried to actually go back and look for that locality uh, back in 2019. And unfortunately, we found some interesting information. It, it came from a place called, uh, 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 Point Sublime. And Point Sublime is a long, windy Jeep trail to get to this area, which you can still visit today. But we found out the rocks are wrong. Uh, so we pretty much figured that this tooth did not come exactly from Point Sublime, even though classically it's been listed from there. Um, but I want you to take a look at the tooth on the right. That actually, this, it's the same species, but it's from a tooth found in southern Arizona, not far from where I grew up. And again, this is a, a shark that had monstrous teeth, but for its body size, it's actually a lot less than the size of a, a megalodon. Megalodon is, is figured to be approximately 50 feet long. This thing was probably not much more than eight or nine feet in length. They had these massive uh, uh, razor sharp teeth. So getting into our PRI for the Grand Canyon, um, we tried to go find the site where uh, Megalodon pelis was first found, didn't find it. But on the way there, we found some sites that actually were very promising. And I have a hypothesis is that actually these uh, localities that we've discovered may actually be the source uh, sites for Megalodon pelis. Um, we got to this place that we, we have dubbed Shark Ridge. And Shark Ridge, we, we spent maybe about 10 minutes and then we found this kind of uh, sandy limestone layer and it was just full of uh, fish material. Uh, the picture in the middle is a partial shark's fin spine that's actually going into the matrix. And we just picked it up like that. The other end of the spine is actually sticking out on the other end. So I still have some work to do on prepping this thing out. Um, and it's probably a early modern shark relative um, dorsal fin spine. Uh, the other chunk of rock, uh, again, we just picked it up just like that. It's full of bony fish teeth and scales and a few other uh, sharky bits. Um, and those kind of things are great if you, if you have the right kind of acids, you break down, and you get thousands of small individual fish parts that you can use to identify what you have as part of your fauna. Uh, we continue to search around the corner and, and this is where we started to say, yep, this is the place we call Shark Ridge. The whole uh, essentially uh, cliffside was just chock full of tiny little fish bits. But then we found some other uh, slabs of limestone that actually had larger fossils. So the, the tooth in the right-hand corner is actually a new record. It's a ratfish called Crassiodonta succinbergi. And Crassiodonta up until this point was only found from two other localities anywhere in the world. One site was in Wyoming, the other site was in Russia. So this specimen here was uh, another expansion of this uh, species. And it's also the first record of this shark for the Kaibab. Um, and again, we're finding these surfaces are just loaded with tiny little teeth and things like that. There's a little hybridon uh, shark tooth on the bottom there. Um, but then kind of metaphorically, you know, maybe a little bit literally across the road, 
um, was this site, uh, which we dubbed Bone City. Now, this is, these sites are both around the North Rim, and the North Rim is, is uh, Ponderosa Pine Forest on that section. It's a very beautiful place to, to visit. I highly recommend uh, checking out if you ever get out west. Um, it was a slightly different lithology. Uh, the picture on the left uh, shows Bone City, the, the exposure of Bone City. Um, and I want you to kind of point out the, the big reddish smear kind of in the middle of it. It's a sandstone lens, essentially, or a marine sandstone lens. And that had rocks that were full of bone. Um, but on either side of that was also rock, limestone rock, that um, had a bit of an oolitic mineral to it. Um, so oolites are essentially minerals that have been uh, rewashed and reworked uh, with uh, wave action. They form basically little egg-shaped rocks uh, that actually make up the rock. Um, but these uh, were also full with bone. Um, so the name Bone City fit really well with this site. Uh, so we took a bunch of that stuff back and um, in the process of actually doing some major lab work on it. Uh, which I'll show you in a second. But we also went to, well, sorry, this other site where we found this, actually, this large uh, shark tooth. Um, this is from a petalodon. Uh, I originally, I was so ecstatic because I thought this was another specimen of Megatina pellis. This would have been the second specimen of Megatina pellis from the North Rim. But the thing is, the morphology of this tooth is way different than any of the other, other Megatina pellis specimens I've seen uh, anywhere. Um, it's not symmetrical. It's actually kind of like a lateral tooth, but it's still pretty big. So this may be actually a new species of pelodont for the Grand Canyon. Um, and this actually, I want to point out that uh, Max Bovis found this specimen. Uh, we went to the South Rim and there's actually an aptly named site called Fossil Mountain, which is on the left there. And this wasn't quite as exciting as uh, the Shark Ridge or the Bone City site, but we did find tiny little micro fossils of vertebrates uh, throughout the section there. Most of it's isolated little fish teeth. Um, what's also kind of weird here is that some of the, the, the vertebrate fossils eroded out, actually leaving natural casts. And so this was actually a, uh, sorry, a mold. This was a natural mold of a tina shark on the left there, or, sorry, the right. Um, and uh, we collected a few things and I was able to extract a few a few uh, material from, from using uh, acid prep. Um, but this, this site wasn't quite as rich, but this is the type section for the lower part of the uh, Kaibab, aptly named the Fossil Mountain member. And uh, so we gathered that. And then we found this other weird little site where we're trying to check a little uh, drainage area, not far. And it was this random rock right next to where we parked. And uh, on the underside of this rock, when you kind of looked under the, the little corner there, there actually was this large peladon tooth eroding out from uh, as almost a perfect cross section. And this is most definitely a Megatina pelis tooth. So now we have a record of Megatina pelis on the south rim, which is new to, uh, to everybody. But we took a bunch of stuff back. So this is kind of like uh, my backyard lab, essentially. Uh, put things essentially bathe rock in uh, five gallon buckets of uh, vinegar and slowly let them dissolve. And it takes months to chemically break down some of this material. Um, and it takes like, you know, hundreds of man hours just to pick through all of it. Um, but I screen wash everything and got, you know, thousands of little bits of pieces of things. So the picture on the right there, it's full of teeth of bony fish or some fragments of sharks. There's actually some, uh, there's actually a little micro clam uh, in the picture there, kind of on the left-hand side. Um, and from that work, especially from the Bone City area, we got lots of really cool stuff. So we get, you know, I got hundreds of bony fish scales. I've got lots and lots of tiny little bony fish vertebrae, which in this time frame, most of the, of the bony fish that we know of um, do not have ossified vertebrae that uh, bony fish have in, like say, by the Mesozoic and the, and the Cenozoic. So this is actually uh, an important piece of information here. Um, I got chunks of tinicant teeth, and I, I literally say chunks because that oolitic substance that's been wave action uh, process, they break apart and actually wear down into almost like bone uh, pebbles. Um, but from that sandstone layer, I was actually getting highly detailed uh, uh, fish parts. So I got uh, a neosilation, a tiny little shark tooth that's, that's basically a millimeter there. 
Um, I got more pelodonts. I've got uh, marine xenocant's teeth. I got more hybodonts. And then these weird little items on the right there, they're actually uh, dermal denticles or uh, typically scales of uh, uchondrocephalans. So I have one type called uh, Holmesia, which is kind of a technical name for a group of scale types. And you find these actually in a lot of different kinds of uchondrocephalans. So these ratfish relatives, so like the erotodonts and the parasolacans, they have these kinds of scales. Um, but then I also have spiny scales and great loads too. And um, at first I thought that maybe these were crowns of, of tenacanth or some more form teeth that it just popped off, but they're actually their vascular uh, systems are actually on the edges, which is a, a trait you see only in dermal denticles rather than teeth. Uh, getting into Mammoth Cave. So this is a little bit more recent. I started this project at near the end of 2019 and worked on it more uh, just this last year. Um, Mammoth Cave, for those you don't know, is the longest case system in the world. It's kind of this interesting, uh, almost honeycomb hive structure of various different channels and, and things put together. Um, it's a fairly large park. It's located in central Kentucky. And these cave systems were formed by underground rivers uh, during the Miocene. And this is one of the more bizarre alien uh, localities that I've been working with. And um, you see these fantastic uh, slagmite and slagtite structures. Um, but a lot of these sites you have to get into, uh, you can, they can be very tight. Um, so there's a picture of uh, Rick Toomey on the, on the lower uh, left there. Um, that is as tall as both the uh, floor and ceiling. You have to crawl to get into these places. Um, there's a picture of me in the middle where I'm stuck between two rocks trying to extract a tooth. But then there's other uh, of these passageways, they're super tall. So there's Rick Olson uh, kind of on the uh, second to the left there. He's standing on a eight foot uh, uh, ladder looking up at some interesting shark fossils from that site. And of course, you also have these uh, amazing, uh, uh, I guess we uh, call like uh, drops and, and tunnels. Um, so I'm looking down uh, essentially one uh, a tube that, that formed from uh, uh, water eroding things away. And it's like, you know, stories, like multiple stories tall. And of course, you, we have these amazing little crave critter, critters, like these little cave salamanders. Um, but it's still actively eroding too. So these, like I said, these passages are formed by underground rivers and these are underground rivers still exist. So we actually get into kayaks and to get to some of these localities. Um, so this is me and my crew back in 2020 in October. And uh, we kind of lucked out that it was actually slightly seasonally, uh, the water levels were actually much lower than usual. And we've actually found out that there are shark teeth in the floor of the cave, not only just the walls and the ceiling. So um, we had a, a blast, you know, kayaking underground and then picking up uh, or chiseling out uh, at these sites, uh, shark fossils. So the right hand corner there is a shark tooth on the, on the right. And then there's also a, a shark spine of a tenacanth on the left. And it was just totally, uh, mixed with shark fossils uh, at this one section. So what is uh, Mammoth Cave? It actually represents the late Mississippian world, approximately 340 to 330 million years ago. And with the, the stratigraphy with the inside the, the cave system, the, the primary cave system in Mammoth Cave, um, there are three major geologic uh, formations that are represented. Uh, the St. Louis limestone, which is the oldest, uh, the St. Genevieve, which is in the middle, and the Gherkin formations, which is on top. And they're roughly what we call the Visayan age or Visayan stage. Uh, so they're kind of in between the 330, 335 million year range. Um, but what I'm going to kind of focus more on for this, this talk is what we call the St. Genevieve formation and the Joppa member. This particular uh, horizon is extremely rich in fossils. Um, within the short amount of time between, again, late 2019 to very recently, uh, we've collected well over, um, you know, 300 specimens uh, thus far. And uh, there is a very rich uh, invertebrate fossils. Now, one thing I want to kind of point out is that when you look at some of these pictures I'm, I'm showing you, you're thinking, okay, uh, some of these are, are on the cave wall. 
Um, that's not always necessarily the case. Some of these are, I'm actually looking up <laughs> at looking at these fossils. So a lot of these are actually in the cave ceiling. Um, and of course, there's loads and loads of shark fossils. And these are just a couple of examples of some of the stuff that uh, we've seen so far. Um, many of these we've collected, and there's also a f there are a few that are still actually within the cave, just so because they're so fragile, we have to kind of pick and choose which specimens you want to take out. Um, but this is what Mammoth Cave used to look like uh, 330 million years ago, this specifically with the, the Joppa member. Um, this was done by, for us for the National Park Service by Julius Sassoni. Um, he's very well known for doing his digital painting, uh, especially for dinosaurs. Um, and he did all the artwork for the new Smithsonian uh, uh, Fossil Hall. Uh, that you, if you visit there, a lot of the pictures of uh, depicting uh, ancient organisms was done by Julius, and he did this for, uh, for us for this project. And this is going to get into some of the sharks we find at Mammoth Cave. So we have a whole variety of samorids, so like Stethocanthus falcatus, which you do not have at the Grand Canyon um, or in the Kaibab. Um, we do have the marine xenocanth called Bransonella. We do find that. Uh, at Mammoth Cave, and we also find it in the Grand Canyon. There's two separate species. Um, then you have the Phobodont thrinacidus. And again, thrinacidus has these uh, grip, grapple hook like teeth. Um, here's a closer look of more uh, Bransonella teeth. And again, you know, we have the different varieties of Samorids. Uh, Tinicants. Uh, again, this is, this is actually a group that is one of my favorites. We found quite a few isolated teeth of Tinicants. Uh, within Mammoth Cave. Um, some of these are quite large. Uh, one animal called Cyvotus is, is one of these that have been found basically throughout the entirety of the uh, Mammoth Cave uh, sections. So you find it in the St. Louis, you find it in the St. Genevieve and the Gherkin. Um, but then you have some other taxa like this uh, animal called Clodotus, which is only known from the St. Genevieve at this time. Um, and then we have a new species, it's, it's a smaller tinacanth. But what's very exciting, especially for me, is that the preservation at Mammoth Cave is phenomenal. Uh, <laughs> getting ahead of myself, but this is actually a teeny can spine. So we also get the spines, not only their teeth, but this is the phenomenal preservation we're getting. We actually are getting fossilized cartilage um, from Mammoth Cave. And uh, the, these ancient channels, when they carved right through the, the limestones, um, this is what they left behind. So this is actually the lower jaw of uh, the tinicanth called Cyvotus striatus. That jaw you're looking at in the picture is roughly two and a half feet long. Um, to put that in perspective, um, a jaw of a large great white does not reach those dimensions. Um, and so that tells us that Cyvotus uh, was something that actually reached the size of a great white or greater. And uh, we've been finding a number of teeth, um, especially this last trip in October. Um, and uh, I do know of uh, the average Cyvotus tooth width, and that's some, some of the ways we kind of extrapolate the, the body size of some of these sharks. Um, it's about two and a half uh, centimeters wide. And usually when you get to that dimension, you're, you're, you're looking at an animal that is about a great white in, uh, in length. Um, but there is a specimen from Europe that is six centimeters wide. So that's actually suggesting that Cyvotus can actually get much larger, uh, far greater than any great white that has ever lived on this planet, even, even some of the fossil forms. So we're, we're talking about things, not quite megalodon, but uh, each inching their ways uh, towards that. And then, uh, very exciting for me, is uh, this. This is actually the right side of the face of a shark. Um, it's the upper and lower jaw and parts of the, uh, the hyoid area. It's got uh, loaded with teeth, and it's from a shark called Glicmanius. Now, Glicmanius is very common at the Grand Canyon. Um, and, uh, and up until this time, all we knew of Glicmanius was primary teeth. It's really well known from the, the Pennsylvania to the Permian. Um, it was kind of had a scant fossil record in the late Mississippian. Um, but this is actually the first really definitive saying, yes, this is this uh, genus of shark is, is from the, uh, the late Mississippian. And this is the first cranial material of this animal. So the first true skeletal material. Uh, so this is going to be a part of a project I'll be working on later this year. So getting into the ratfish relatives, uh, we've got Parasolachians and, and a variety of different types of or, or Um 
Um, again, they have really weird crushing teeth for the orodontids. Um, the Parasalacians even get more bizarre. There's an animal called Venus Stotus that actually had uh, like a hook-like anterior crown and kind of a more of a, I guess they would call, uh, they look like cleats to me of an of a athletic shoe. And uh, in terms of how these teeth actually work, we don't know. We only know them from these weird teeth. But we have yet found a, a complete animal yet. Uh, getting into the pelodonts, there's a whole variety of pelodonts from Mammoth Cave. Um, one of the most common, actually the most common shark is the animal on the left there called Comatotus. And they have these blade-like bars that make up their dentition. Uh, we have tiny little uh, pelodonts as well. Things are probably not much bigger than the palm of your hand. Um, we have a new species of a animal called Petalotus. Now, Petalotus is really well known for people who collect uh, Paleozoic shark teeth, especially the from the Pennsylvanian, uh, from an animal called Petalotus ohioensis. Um, but there's a new one at Mammoth Cave. And then we have another thing uh, I mentioned before, there's these skate-like animals, and this specifically is an animal called Janassa. Uh, Janassa is actually known for complete uh, Permian species. And uh, they do look like skates. They have a very pointed nose. Their uh, mouths are subterminal. And they have these huge pectoral ray-like fins with a little sharky tail. Um, and we actually have a new species of that animal uh, from Mammoth Cave as well. Uh, of course, getting into the ratfish, we do have the really weird goblin-like halotus. Um, we have an animal called Samotus. Samotus is actually interesting in that it has very bar-like tooth plates. And some of these can get massive. Um, one that I saw at the park was about as long as my hand. Um, and I have a big hand. And um, they're also very hard to remove from the uh, from the cave walls because a lot of times they're actually going directly into the cave rather than being uh, kind of exposed on the sides. And if they're going directly in, the limestone actually gets harder from the uh, outer surface going in. And uh, to risk uh, not breaking it, a lot of the times we have to leave these Samotis teeth uh, behind. But we do get a whole variety of really weird ratfish teeth. Um, Samotis is the one directed as E. Um, but then we have something new. This is just nicknamed washboard tooth. Um, it's almost like a tooth whorl. So it's almost like individual teeth that fuse together to form a single plate. But I think what this is, this actually is a single plate that actually formed this kind of washboard crown system. Um, I have yet seen anything quite like this. There's something from Russia that's sort of close to this. Um, except there's some odd details down the middle. Um, ours are completely straight across where there's actually a, a indentated groove uh, from the Russian species, but this may be related to that. And then we have polywagus. Um, there's a quick story about polywagus. It was actually found by one of our uh, volunteer staff uh, that was helping us out uh, in October. And what you're looking at is a tiny little tooth and you're looking from the underside of it. Um, the knob on the right is actually the primary cusp or the largest cusp of, of this uh, uh, little tooth. And there's actually three cusps that are on this. Um, the pointed uh, needle-like structure actually actually is the root. Um, and this was uh, nicknamed by both Kelly and, and Rick Olson as polywog. It kind of looks like a polywog. Um, so it kind of brings to the questions like, well, what is this thing? So there's one hypothesis. Um, it's some sort of Parasalacian or Eugenodon symphysial tooth whorl. So this is like the middle tooth of these world two sharks. Um, they arose during the late Mississippi, so they should be here. And they became the, pretty much the dominant predators during the pretty much all of the Pennsylvanian and, and the early Permian. And they did go extinct uh, actually by the early Triassic. They did survive the great Permian Triassic extinction. Um, but there's another idea, which would actually be really cool. It's actually a group of chondrichthians called Enopterygians or bat sharks. So this would be actually exciting for us. Uh, Mammoth Cave is really well known for its uh, diversity of bats. Um, so can you imagine not only you have living bats, but you also have bat sharks living uh, within the cave itself. And these are extremely diverse during the Mississippi and all the way until the Pennsylvanian. Um, they kind of uh, died off by the uh, early per uh, Permian. Um, and they're known from complete specimens from Montana and Illinois, and they have very specialized teeth. So, and they're almost world-like, similar to Eugenodonts. So there's still some debate whether this is actually something that's related to ratfish, or it should be a very distinct third group of chondrichthians um, compared to the other two that we have. So we still have our work uh, cut out for us. 
uh, and a lot of more exciting things to, to work through. Um, but with that, um, does anybody have any questions? And thank you for listening. AP, we have one question from Rick, and I don't know if, I, I, uh, if how big did uh, Cladotus get? Did you cover that? So Clod uh, Clodotus actually reached approximately about the same size as Cyvotus. Um, there are some specimens, especially from Mammoth Cave, that suggest that Clodotus actually reached great white dimensions. Um, so we have two large teeth of Clodotus uh, from Mammoth Cave um, of a shark called Clodotus mirabilis. And mirabilis was a very big uh, predatory shark. Um, Jonathan is interested. Are there any monographs or articles you'd recommend covering shark uh, evolutionary history? There are a couple of interesting papers. Um, there is one that was actually an overview by uh, my, actually my, my graduate advisors, uh, Dr. Eileen Grogan and Dr. Richard Lund. Uh, from St. Joseph's University, where I, where I got my master's. Um, they actually have a publication now that kind of overviews uh, early Paleozoic sharks and how they relate to the, uh, the more modern lineages. Uh, there's also a couple of good, decent overview books. Um, there is one by uh, John Long, who's an Australian paleontologist. It's called The Rise and Falls of Fishes, which is a fantastic resource. Uh, not only into Paleozoic uh, fishes of all different varieties, not even, not just sharks, um, but also talks about uh, some of the uh, like uh, going into Mesozoic and Cenozoic types as well. Um, and there's another one by John Maisie, and, um, and unfortunately that title for uh, is escaping me right now. But John Maisie is actually a really good uh, fish paleontologist, and he does a decent overview as well. It's an older volume, but it's still pretty. It stands up fairly well still. Um, if you want more technical things on Paleozoic sharks or even prehistoric sharks in general, there's a series from a German publisher. They're not cheap, but you can find people who have access to PDFs that actually goes into the details of, you know, various different kinds of not only shark teeth um, from Mesozoic and Cenozoic times, but Paleozoic shark teeth, Paleozoic shark skeletons, um, and there's all the whole volume on uh, ratfish as well. So, um, I may be able to get more detailed uh, uh, titles for that to you guys uh, uh, after this presentation. Um, Mason wants to know, um, is there something you haven't found in these rocks that you'd be really interested in finding? Uh, Mason, that's a great question. So comparing the two sites, so at the Grand Canyon, we actually have good evidence of the uh, new salation, so the modern sh shark branch uh, of the family tree, but at the uh, Mammoth Cave site, we don't have we have hardly anything like that. We have protoacrodonts; they're kind of rare, but we have them. But we don't have anything that I would expect. Um, there's an animal called Culiella, which is known from the late Mississippian, um, and we find their tiny little teeth uh, at the Grand Canyon, and it should be at Mammoth Cave, but I have not come across it yet. Uh, so I'm keeping my eye out for for that specimen with some of our. Uh, um, uh, some of the work I'm doing with screen watching from Mammoth Cave. Uh, and would in, Tracy uh, is interested, would any of these be competing with or preying on uh, Dunkleosteus? I'm not saying that correctly. Dunkleosteus. Uh, <laughs> no, neither of these faunas from the Grand Canyon or the Mammoth Cave, these actually are after Dunkleosteus. Dunkleosteus was a Devonian fish, especially at the end of the late Devonian. Um, and it's a massive predatory fish. Um, and you do find relatives of, of certain groups that I talked about. Uh, you do find uh, orodontids there. You do find tinicants uh, in these rocks where you find uh, Dunkleosteus. But after Dunkleosteus went extinct at the Devonian, um, this is actually when we start seeing monster sharks, um, like the, the erododonts get really big and the tinicants get really big. Um, and then by the Pennsylvanian, you get things like the giant uh, eugenodonts as well. So um, 
Yeah, so no, at this time, Dunkleosteus was not there. It worry went extinct. And this is about the time when sharks are really taking off in their diversity because they're not competing with uh, Dunkleosteus and its group called the Placoderms. And uh, well, Val said they would drive her crazy because every pebble might be something. And I agree, when you look at all those little things, how do you know if something is something or something is nothing? You have to look for the anatomical signatures. So um, what I'm looking for is the cellular uh, parts of the, essentially the bone I'm, uh, or, uh, yeah, it is bone. So the, the dermal tentacles are bony underneath. The, the roots are, are kind of bony. So I'm looking for all those little porous holes. Um, but then they also will have an enamel crown very much like a tooth. So they're the shiny parts. Um, and those are the little telltale signatures I'm looking for under a microscope. Um, and again, this, the stuff that I'm working on with the Grand Canyon, a lot of it was very eroded because, again, wave action was kind of eroding these things down into little pebbles. Um, but there was enough details left, even after they've been reworked, um, that told me, okay, yeah, this is a bone and this is just like calcium carbonate or something like that. So. And it's the, the diversity. Everybody is very um, uh, amazed at the diversity. Is the, is the Paleozoic area the most diverse for, for sharks? Um, at this current time, yes, because um, they are only competing with themselves. There are no other vertebrate organisms that they are competing with. When you get to the Permian Triassic extinction event, of course, you have this recovery rate. But what would end up happening is that a lot of the niches that were filled by sharks as being the mega predators, they began to be filled in by reptiles. So this is when you start getting like the ancestors to ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. They're starting to fill in those niches and they get large really fast. By the end of the Triassic, which is, uh, I want to say about 250 million years ago, you have some giant reptile uh, marine organisms. Uh, one of the ones is Shoshonesaurus, which is a giant uh, ichthyosaur that was about the size of some whales today. Do you have a favorite shark species and a favorite fossil? <laughs> um, I am biased that um, my Godzilla shark is my top favorite right now, um, though Cyvotus is ticking rapidly that that uh, right behind it because it's such a giant monstrous uh, shark. Um, outside of sharks, um, I guess I can break it down to a couple categories. Um, I'm also I was originally trained as a mammalian paleontologist, so I'm really into fossil cats. So that's my next major group of fossil organisms that I'm interested in. Um, but in terms of like when I'm working at Dinosaur Park, the, some of my most favorite things to find are um, some of the dromaeosaur uh, raptorial dinosaur teeth that we find there. Uh, those are really neat. And, um, or I'm still trying to find a ceratopsian tooth. We have ceratopsians uh, at Dinosaur Park, but they're extremely rare. So um, that's actually my, my wish fossil right now of my, uh, uh, life, uh, life list of things to find is a, a Maryland ceratopsy and horned dinosaur uh, at some point. So give me my fingers crossed next rains. So we'll, we'll get one exposed. Bring on the hurricanes. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> is the, um, are there places that amateurs can hunt for Paleozoic sharks? And I guess along with that, I mean, when you're in the Grand Canyon, are you allowed to pick up fossils and take them home? No. So the one thing I, so there's different rules for different places, especially also, right. I have to warn everyone. It's like, even in here in Maryland, there are like the, be very careful picking up anything at say national parks in Maryland. Um, Cause the national park service has a, a complete, do not pick, leave it behind kind of thing. Notify somebody if you find something important, that kind of thing. Um, same thing as the Grand Canyon and Mammoth Cave. There's there's no fossil collecting whatsoever in Mammoth Cave without a permit. Um, and even you have to have a scientific permit for doing that. Because most people, when they go to Mammoth Cave, they, they want to see the cave and the bats and things like that. Uh, so most, for the, the announcement to we have, oh yeah, we found sharks inside Mammoth Cave, blew everybody's mind locally there. The Grand Canyon, same kind of thing. Um, they there's fossils everywhere when especially we're walking along the the rim um and there is no collecting of fossils there if if somebody is caught collecting fossils there's heavy fines and jail time involved 
However, there are places outside of the Grand Canyon that, yeah, you can find fossils. Like a lot of stuff that I was collecting from Flagstaff were from uh, road cuts, which I had uh, permits for. And there's there's certain rules in Arizona that allow to collect invertebrate fossils um, and some some vertebrate stuff, though most rather you did not collect vertebrate fossils in Arizona. So, but invertebrates collect as many as you want. But in terms of Maryland, Propeliosaur sharks, you know, there's actually a locality I want to find, and maybe you guys can help me out. Um, I have come across a petal lotus tooth that comes from the Deep Creek area uh, along the Maryland Panhandle. And um, all records indicate that it actually comes from Paleozoic rocks from that region. So um, if I can do some more homework, I would actually kind of like to kind of resurrect as a project, seeing we can find more Paleozoic sharks of Maryland. Um, by doing that. So maybe that's, maybe it can be a group project you can always think about doing. Oh, I think that sounds awesome. Any other questions for JP? He really uh, laid a lot of knowledge on us. We went on a, we went, we, we covered a lot of ground, I think. Yeah, uh, this is Rick Olson. Uh, can you hear me? Hi, Rick. Hey, how you doing, JP? Everyone, this is Rick Olson, who's my, my uh, cohort in the Ma uh, Mammoth Cave project. So say, say hi to Rick, everybody. Yep. Hi, Rick. Hello, hello. Anyway, um, first of all, uh, uh, Rick Toomey and his wife Elizabeth are on hardship duty uh, down in the Virgin Islands right now. And that's why he's not in attendance. Uh, <laughs> so I, just so you know. And uh, also, JP, just an absolutely awesome presentation. Um, uh, I'm just tingling all over. It's so exciting. And uh, when you get caught up, because I know that you, you've got a lot of work with Grand Canyon and report writing and so forth to do, on my dining room table, I have six vials ready to go, ready to send to you. And um, I know that, let's see, uh, since we went to Roaring River, we got back there and further back towards the sump, there's so many shark fossils and stuff in the ceiling, uh, you can't believe it. And then also, as you know, in uh, Logsdon River, uh, we're gonna be d busy down there for years. And of course, that's not, that's not in the St. Genevieve, that's in the lower um, uh, uh, strata in the St. Louis limestone, but I mean, we've, we've got really great stuff in, including um, one object that uh, uh, JP thinks is a, a brain case for, to one of the sharks. And um, so we're, we're gonna be busy doing this for years. Uh, we're the poster that um, he put together for October for the Society of Vertebrate Paleontologists, I think has about 40 different species. Uh, since then, I think he said he's identified maybe 10 more, and um, we just don't know where it's going to end, but this is just so exciting. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Rick. And yeah, you got me all excited and uh, anxious to get some of the stuff you got on your table now. Um, yeah, so one thing I failed to mention is the diversity of some of these shark localities that we've been looking at at the, at the national parks. Um, the Kaibab, as of right now, when you think about the total uh, of the Kaibab and the Flagstaff region and the Grand Canyon combined, we have something getting close to 50 species of sharks. That's almost ridiculous compared to other shark localities that we know of, uh, especially for the Paleozoic. Uh, a lot of these will probably maybe have 20. Uh, so to have that high number is, is, is amazing. Um, and then Mammoth Cave is actually now starting to surpass the Kaibab, uh, especially from the St. Genevieve uh, Formation Horizon. Um, and who knows what the, the lower and upper beds are going to be like. But the St. Genevieve actually has 50, maybe 50 plus different kinds of chondrichthians identified from teeth and other parts. So that's phenomenal. That, so that, that suggests like the late Mississippian was like the, the major heyday for, for sharks. So, um, and yeah, Rick is right. We don't know what else we can find when we start looking at some of these other passageways. So the one site he was talking about, Logston, the, the one way can you only really, there's two ways you can get to it. One, you can travel through miles of passageway going up and down and tight passages and things like that, squeezing through little tiny crevices. Um, or you can go down a, a uh, I think it's like a, something like a two and a half foot wide borehole um, that goes about 78 feet down. <laughs> so, um, so you have to, uh, 
it's going to be an adventure to get to some of these places. Um, they showed me the borehole uh, my last trip in October. At that time, I was like, no, I'm now trying to get myself because I'm a big guy. Um, I'm not sure if I can fit through two and a half feet, but um, I'm working on slimming myself down so I can during the spring get down that passage to see what the, what they got in, and the logs in sight. Because a brain case in the ceiling of a cave of a shark is a sight is exciting for me. So I want to go see that for myself. So. Well, JP, it is the new year. And so, you know, you can have a resolution there, right? Exactly. That's, that's my <laughs> resolution is get down that borehole. So find more sharks. We're, we're, all, we're here to help you. Okay. We'll, we'll do it. Sounds good, Rick. Any other questions for JP or, and or Rick? All right, this has been wonderful. Um, uh, JP, thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. I look around and everybody does look a lot smarter than we started, so you did a great job with that. Um, and I hope that um, we get an opportunity to come out to Dinosaur Park as a society uh, on a field trip and, and work with you uh, further on that. And, and digging down into Maryland's um, uh, fossil, fossil history. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. Don't forget tomorrow we have micro minerals. Um, if you're interested in that, go ahead and register. We have a lot of other events coming up. If you want to uh, support us, become a member, buy a raffle ticket. There's that fossilized feather that's um, in, in the raffle. Um, prize package for February. And next month for the, for the Fossil Club, we're gonna be doing something a little bit different and trying it out via Zoom, um, a show and tell. So you can bring our favorite, uh, bring our favorite fossils uh, to the Zoom and, and share it with everybody else in our collections. Um, until then, everybody be safe. Uh, and be well, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Gavin. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin.